Welcome back to the Information Security Forum podcast. As ever, we're in conversation with Steve Durbin to discuss cybersecurity exercises, valuable breach prevention. Steve, while cybersecurity exercises are not a new practice, they do appear to be back in vogue. We know that there has been an increase in organizations running internal cybersecurity exercises off the back of recent breaches such as Petya. The obvious benefit to running these exercises would be for an organization to be prepared when they are under attack, know exactly how to respond, and mitigate the risk. But this seems like a big task that would take a lot of resources and a lot of time. There must be different levels of complexity associated with running a cybersecurity exercise, depending on the size and business sector of the organization. So where might an organization begin in determining whether to run a cybersecurity exercise? Yeah, it's a a really good question, Tavia, because I think that there are a lot of organizations out there that think, um, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll Mm -hmm. we'll put it off. Uh, We don't have the time to do it. We don't have the resource to do it. Maybe we don't know where to start. Uh, And so I think a useful starting point is just to, uh, again, to to take a look at the sort of information that you're sharing across the organization and just ask yourself the question, what would happen if that was no longer available to me? So that that identifies some of the critical elements that that you really need to focus on in terms of continuing to run your business. Because I'm not suggesting that every organization, I think, runs a you know an annual cybersecurity exercise across the enterprise. That that isn't uh, that isn't what it's all about. It is about how do we make sure that come the day when we have had a breach or we've lost information or whatever it may be, we can respond in an effective fashion. How do we identify some of the upcoming threats and risks to our business? Now, organizations may want to to use something like uh, a threat visualizer. We we have uh, that available to our members at at, at the ISF. That's excellent for planning out threat scenarios. So what we do is we take a lot of the input from our uh, threat work that tends to take this forward-looking perspective, uh, and you're able to then visualize that on on a pretty simple tool to assess really what sort of business impact it might have, how you might respond to it, uh, therefore. And that can help you really to um, nail down the sorts of areas that you need to be working on, along with the level of sophistication of the exercise mm. that you want to go through uh, and potentially the uh, uh, the frequency. So, you know, an example might be that on a, on a regular basis, you might want to run uh, a phishing attacks exercise. So you're concerned that you have all of your users accessing email, a lot of information coming in from the outside. So good practice would say, you know, perhaps on an annual basis, let's run a phishing attack. Um, and let's see how, how people respond to that. The important piece there, of course, is that you provide feedback in the moment. Mm-hmm. What, what you don't want to do is to run a phishing attack and then a month later when you know, you've know uh, you analyzed all of the results and, and departmental heads have had their feedback and all this kind of stuff that, that you then do. It has to be in the moment. So, so when you're thinking about that kind of exercise, it, it's about making it as realistic as possible. It's not about um, making people, people feel you know, stupid or, or, or less than competent mm-hmm. because we all will, will click on the wrong links at, at some point. Um, it's about how do you then try to uh, train people to avoid doing that in in the future. So a phishing attack would be one that uh, is relatively easy to to implement, um, and you'd probably want to do that across the business. Uh, perhaps a little bit more sophisticated, so sort of moderate level would be what we call sort of red and blue teaming. Mm-hmm. So attack teams versus defend defend teams. Mm-hmm. You would probably want to be doing that on um, very specific elements of your information. Uh, of your data, uh, particularly perhaps things that um, you're you're concerned about, perhaps not bringing the organization to a grinding halt, but which would have a uh, either a very significant financial impact uh, or indeed might prevent you from perhaps moving into a new geographic area or launching a new product, that that sort of thing. the The third piece, which I think um, is quite sophisticated is is a multi-pronged attack. It's the sort of thing that we see happening in financial services organizations in, in particular. So it's about taking multiple levels of attack, perhaps denial of service or mixed in with some other things, uh, to really try to test the organization. Um, and you're probably going to be doing that on a much 
rarer basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be spending a lot more time thinking that through. You're going to be aligning it certainly with some of the other things that I've mentioned in, in terms of uh, you know threat visualization, uh, perhaps uh, identifying some of the vulnerabilities that you know you have across the business. And there are some tools, again, from the ISF that you can use to do that. So our uh, IRAM2 um, tool, for instance, helps you to try to identify some of those some of those things. Um, but I think that uh, you know what's important is that you have a plan for managing these things, N not just to get them done, but also then to integrate them back into mm -hmm. that ongoing security process because it's pointless really doing one of these exercises if all you're then going to do is put the findings on a shelf and not uh, not learn anything sure. from it. So it is very much an iterative process in, in terms of how you go about uh, how you go about doing this. Hmm. You know, it occurs to me that this is where battles will be fought in the future in in the cyber realm instead of on the ground do you think that's a fair projection yeah i think so i think we've we've we continue to hear certainly at uh, government level doesn't matter which part of the world you happen to be in um talk of you know cyber attack uh, that that isn't just going to be nation state against nation state of course there are some very critical organizations in the private sector that provide service um there is critical infrastructure uh, that, that uh, of course, no country can manage without that will necessarily get caught up in some of this. And so the running of uh, cyber simulation exercises, security exercises, is, is really pretty fundamental in those areas um, to just make sure that uh, you know your defences really are as good as they need to be. But more importantly, to test how you respond. Mm -hmm. Because it has to be said that if an attacker is very determined they will probably get through, particularly if we're talking about nation state. So, um, you know, spend a little bit less time, I suppose, worrying on it, about how you might prevent some of those uh, full-scale multi-pronged attacks and a little bit more time on how you're going to respond to them, how you're going to protect information, how you're going to get back up and running quickly, and how you're going to communicate some of the messages that you need to be communicating uh, right the way across the business and indeed with the... Uh, um, the public or, or uh, other organizations that you're working with at large. Running drills, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What does a successful cybersecurity exercise look like? I, I think it's one that uh, really produces insight for you into how your organization is responding. So that, that's that's what I would say. And, and, you know, I'm thinking in particular here of, of uh, uh, again, going back to the General Data Protection Regulation, a number of organizations that I'm aware of, uh, the, the ISF included, is th they're running simulations. So we're looking at things like subject access requests. How do we respond to those? We're looking at um, how might we respond to loss of data. So we are playing out attack scenarios so that we're better prepared for incidents that uh, that might come about. And I think, again, some of the better ones are related to what people understand to change at the moment. So, you know, GDPR is a good example because that has changed significantly the way in which we manage personal information. Mm -hmm. You also have, of course, uh, legislation behind it with some real teeth. So there's, some, uh, you know, financial implications. So there is an incentive, if you like, for organizations to actually get it get it right. And that's a pretty good place to uh, to be. Um, in, from a financial services space, you know, it has to be said that there's some, there are probably some of the some world class cyber exercises that are run there. Uh, the banks very often getting together, whether it be at a, a national level or uh, um, across legislative level, to to really test how they would respond. So that critical infrastructure that I was just talking about, you know, I include banks in that, mm -hmm. um, and really stress testing. The, uh, the the banks, their ability to respond, their ability to share information with the necessary authorities um, and to walk through all of the different scenarios. Good cyber uh, simulation exercises, of course, won't just be um, vanilla flavoured. There will be multiple things that happen. So you will walk people through certain scenarios. You will then change the scenario and they will have to respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some very good uh, uh, software-based applications that help you to do that, that where you can really increase or, or decrease the level of sophistication, depending on what it is that uh, that, that you want to do. So th th there's a very real sort of industry, if you like, that's, that's setting up in this particular area. And is it necessary? Yes, absolutely. Should most organizations be going through it? 
undoubtedly. But it's all about the level. So uh, again, you know, if you're a, a small business listening to this, you're, you're probably not going to get into some of that higher uh, level of sophistication. But you should at least be thinking about phishing attacks. You know, how would you respond to that? What would happen, for instance, if your cloud provider was unable to provide you with the information that you were using? Most small businesses are using cloud services. Mm -hmm. um, most of them don't have rightly or wrongly, the right level of control over the third party provider. So they're taking a standard contract. So they're having to take what it is that the, the provider is is offering um, for reasons of, you know, cost and, and a variety of other things. So it is just worth, worth thinking through some of those and just playing out how would I respond if my cloud provider wasn't able to provide me with access to my uh, to my data? How long could I last without that? Hmm. Uh, and if the answer is not very long, well, what are you going to do about it? And so just play that through. Hmm. It's a lot to think about. Running an effective cyber exercise sounds as if it is highly dependent upon people's buy-in and their participation. And moreover, getting people to think about what they're going to do in that crisis situation. So who are the people and what are the teams required to run such an exercise? And how would you go about getting their buy-in? Yeah, I think there's a number of different levels that, uh, that again, you need to look at here. And, and in my my favorite, I suppose, around these are some of the ones where people aren't aware that they're going to happen. So you don't really want to advertise it widely that you're going to be running a, uh, one of these simulations. Um, and that is the same whether you're talking about a physical, pen physical penetration um, exercise or whether you're talking about um, more more remote and sophisticated ones that we've just been touching on. I think that uh, there are three things that uh, that I would say about it. The, the, the first is, you know, you do have to make it personal. So people do need to understand why it's necessary for them. So this is back to that old chestnut that we keep coming back to about awareness and people mm -hmm. and, and so on. But it is about um, people understanding why it's important. So I think that's part of the messaging that has to go behind all of, all of this. Uh, gamification helps mm. no end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the exercise should actually be... Uh, dare I say it, fun. Um, yes, of course, it has a serious content, but people also afterwards want to be able to look back at it and say, okay, you know, I can see that there was benefit in going through it. I can see that there were different scenarios that were being played out um, and it was an efficient way of, of being able to uh, to manage my my response in that, in that area. I think the other uh, piece that we need to focus on is really simulation at the board level. And it doesn't matter too much what kind of breach you have. If it is serious in nature, then inevitably the board is going to have to be informed. Inevitably, the chief executive is probably going to have to uh, face potentially the press, certainly shareholders, certainly employees, uh, certainly other, other board members. Um, and so just running through that, you know, understanding who gets involved, when do they get involved, um, some people might say, well, it's all about security. So it's the IT people, it's security people. Actually, it, it, it also takes into account things like HR mm. and legal. It takes into account PR, uh, communications, marketing. Um, it also looks at that whole forensic piece in terms of the cleanup mm -hmm. afterwards. You know, how do you really try to find out and dig into who has done what to you? Very few organizations are able to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. Very few organizations have the right level of skill on staff to be able to uh, to draw on that. So where do you go? Who are the people that you've got at the end of a phone when things go wrong that you can pick up and, and effectively will come in and uh, and help you clean up? So it's about thinking through all of those different things too. Some of the other challenges, certainly in the boardroom that we're seeing, is the speed at which you have to respond. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to GDPR, you have a very short time scale to be informing people of of, of a breach. You, know, you have to inform the ICO. You have to uh, really be providing as much information as possible. And, and that is the real challenge. Because in the early days following a breach, you probably don't know very much. So how do you drill a CEO to be able to really respond in that? Because again, research, research has shown that if you can respond effectively in those early days, that reduces the overall impact on the business from a shareholder perspective, from a stock price and, and, and so on. So really, um, I think involving the, the people who have to operate in the front line come the day that something goes wrong 
in running through these simulations, practicing them. Um, it, that's that's time exceptionally well spent. But of course, from a security standpoint, sometimes that can be quite a difficult sell because you're looking to get people who are time poor mm. to participate in something on the basis that it's something it may not happen for another 12 to 18, 18 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think, you know, embedding just the practice of, of running through these things into the way that we do business is, is probably the way to uh, the way to go. And I think that increasingly, as we all become very much more dependent upon cyber, we're all active in cyber for running our businesses. Um, we, we're going to have to just recognise that uh, you know good good cyber hygiene involves running simulation exercises, some of which will be very sophisticated. Um, and uh, we need to do that because that's the only way we're going to learn from our mistakes and, and really get fit for the uh, for the day when we have to do it for real. I always like it when you reinforce the idea that security is company wide; that it is not ever going to be limited to the IT department. It is going to be your HR department and your marketing department and all of those working together. So, getting people to buy into the fact that they are a part of this security solution is. Yeah, I just think that's such a good thing to reinforce. Yeah, I think I think the the, the days are, are, are long gone, frankly, Tavia, when um, security was something that other people did for us. You know, we are still going to be reliant upon IT. Of course, we are for the, for the system. We're still going to be reliant upon the uh, information security people mm-hmm. to to put in place some of the uh, the tools that are required. But the onus, the responsibility for being secure, has shifted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it does sit with users, and um, you know that that really is is the message that we need to be getting across. I, I think both ways, because it isn't just about instructing users what they need to do. It's also about listening to users about how they use technology, mm-hmm. what they actually find easy, not so uh, not so easy, and reflecting that in our security policies and uh, and approaches. And I think running simulation exercises really does stress test that. And, and that, for me, is one of the big values of, uh, of running such programs. Do you think companies are remembering to ask their users how they're interacting with the technology? I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing developmental thing. Uh, a lot of organizations, I think some of the smaller ones, more entrepreneurial. Yes, of course, because they've grown up. They've had the benefit of not having to, to try to unpick legacy systems. Mm-hmm. You know, they've gone straight into the cloud, for instance, they've gone straight into mobile devices. And so it's become natural. I think the ones that struggle a little bit are the ones that have the legacy systems. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, very often those are organizations that are running our critical infrastructure uh, and uh, and are very, very large. And so they have difficult difficulty in trying to, you know, uh, make some of those changes that are more agile, smaller, uh, more youthful type organization uh, might be able to, uh, to accomplish. Interesting. So once you've completed such an exercise, then how do you assess that the objectives have been achieved for both the organization and the teams involved? And finally, how do you make this a sustainable program? Yeah, I, I think that uh, if you get to the end of the of it and, and you're not quite sure whether or not you, you've achieved your objectives, you, you probably stuffed up at the beginning. <laughs> um you know, you, you don't go into these things without understanding very clearly what, what your overall objectives are. What, what is it that you're trying to test? Um, you may well have used things like a threat visualizer. You may well have done work in terms of assessing critical assets and where they lie. And, and so, therefore, that's how you've, you know, honed in your, your simulation exercise. You may well have conducted some benchmarking, uh, either across your organization or indeed comparing it with other organizations to really see where you're particularly strong or, or particularly weak, and you might have decided to, to focus in in those areas. I'd like to think you've also conducted some form of uh, risk assessment mm-hmm. uh, beforehand, again, so that you can you know, really tailor um, your, uh, your simulation. Um, so the objectives are set at the outset, uh, and I think that it, it's important to have clarity of that. How do you assess your success? Well, you measure against the uh, against what you set. So, you know, how did the performance really stack up? Did it meet those objectives? If not, why not? Uh, and again, this this really is should be done from a very positive perspective. It's all about how do you learn. Mm-hmm. It's not about how do you blame. It's about how do you improve. The only way in which you improve your controls is by stress testing them. 
So you may well have adopted, uh, I don't know, say the NIST cybersecurity framework, for instance, or you may have gone down the road of, of uh, using the, um, the ISF standard of good practice for some of your policies and, and, and so on and controls. You're only going to know if they're effective when you stress test them. Mm -hmm. You know, one of, the, one of the, the, the big issues I have with standards is that, yes, they set a bar, but you don't know whether they're doing any good for your organization until you actually stress test them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it, it's about looking at it from that that perspective as well, I think. Um, the exercise will also throw up whether or not some of your people have been properly trained. You know, how did they respond? Uh, it may well be that uh, you highlight a need for your CEO to have some um, media training. Hmm. You know, perhaps he or she did have media training nine, 12 months ago. They've become a little bit rusty. Uh, so, you know, do, do you have a rolling plan of, of putting some of those things in place. Hmm. You, you probably want to take a look at how frequently you might run the exercise. If you had a particularly um, concerning exercise that highlighted a number of deficiencies, you might want to try and put some of those right and then run another simulation after that just to make sure that it had, uh, um, it, it had plugged some of, some of the gaps. So you know, when we talk about things like frequency and, and, uh, and, and focus, it is all about having this ongoing program. You know, clarity of objective around what it is you're trying to achieve, run a program, a very um, iterative process in, in terms of making sure that you've really met those objectives and that they're in line with, with what you're trying to do from a business standpoint, um, and, uh, and then determining collectively across the business uh, how often you need to be uh, running some of these things. Um, and as I say, some of them, you know, are going to be relatively simple to put in place. Others are going to require quite a bit of work, particularly if you're starting to do, um, you know, multi-pronged attacks, for instance. And, and those tend to take place on an annual basis. Uh, phishing, you know, you might want to run those on an ongoing basis. If you're if you're a large organisation, why not pick out different departments at different stages in mm. in the year so people don't know when they, when it's happening? Um, because you're trying to learn from everyday practice. That that's really what it's all about. It's fascinating because it, it requires so much creativity and vision. So I'm I'm intrigued by the idea that people have to uh, have a very broad view and be thinking of these things from a different perspective. As I said, a, a highly creative perspective. I think that's right, and and I think that uh, you know if we look back, you know this is, this is one of the very interesting things about the way in which I think cyber has evolved and and changed. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about creativity mm -hmm. when it comes to running cybersecurity exercises or information security exercises, you know, just even, even uh, just a, a few years ago. So I think that the whole industry has changed very, very significantly. Um, and, you know, increasingly we're going to have to take into account things like artificial intelligence, for instance, in all of this, uh, in all of this area where we are giving over certain areas of, of, of security to, um, to systems, to machines. Uh, and and you know, how do we respond in that in scenario? How do we run simulations in an artificial intelligence uh, in, environment? So I think that, uh, again, it's, it's a fascinating area. It's something that uh, we're currently working on at the moment within the ISF. Um, we are uh, putting together a, uh, a report that's going to look at how to deliver successful cybersecurity exercises and simulations. That, that should be out um, certainly in, uh, uh, in the autumn um, this year, 2018. So... Uh, all of these sorts of things, you know, we're trying to look at capturing. But it's it's a fascinating area, and I think there's something in it for, um, for for quite a few people that perhaps wouldn't necessarily have got involved on the creative side. Mm -hmm. Or we could just go back to paper ledgers, I guess. <laughs> you know, it's another <laughs> we could, option. We could do that. We, could do that. <laughs> we can have a conversation about that sometime. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your insights into how organizations should approach running internal cybersecurity exercises to support breach identification and prevention. It's helpful to know that ISF members have access to a range of resources and tools that will support their efforts, and that the ISF will shortly release a report on delivering a successful cybersecurity exercise, which will provide a more detailed overview on how organizations can determine the type of exercise suitable and how to deploy effective cybersecurity exercises. For more information on ISF's Threats Visualizer, Critical Asset Management, Benchmarking Tool, and Risk Assessment Methodology IRAM 2, please visit securityforum.org. <laughs>